Okay, um, why don't we jump in uh, and pick up the first question. Obviously, the topic for today uh, is all to do uh, with kind of GMB, GMB spam, uh, how to kind of tackle that, how to kind of deal with it. Uh, next week, actually, we've got a chat with Ben Fisher with us, who's going to be talking about um, kind of GMB suspensions and how to kind of get your GMB listings uh, sort of back online and they've been suspended and dealing with things like that. And these two webinars kind of go, or these two clinics go really nicely together. I'm sure there'll be a little bit of overlap, which is absolutely fine. Uh, but we're going to try and focus as much as we can do today uh, on uh, on sort of spam related questions. So I'm just going to uh, jump over the first question. Uh, this one comes uh, from Darcy Burke. Um, and by the way, everyone, if you've got questions, please put them in the ask a question section. And also please upvote any questions that you want uh, Joy and I to prioritize to make sure that we get through those uh, in, the, uh, in the hour that we've got. Um, so the first question comes from Darcy. He says, you know, what do you do if you if you suggest an edit and you never see it getting applied or be, see it, um, you know, uh, being followed through by Google? Yeah. So when you use suggest an edit on Google Maps, so I, I normally suggest using suggest an edit if the listing isn't verified. So that's kind of question number one when you're trying to figure out what path to use. Look to see if the listing's verified. Um, if it's verified. Um, then usually suggest an edit for most things doesn't work. Um, you're better off to use the redressal form, but if the listing is unverified, and if you're wondering how you can tell, you have to be in the Google Maps view. Um, if you see an own this business question mark when you're in Google Maps, it means it's unverified. Um, if that's not there, that means it's verified. But sometimes depending on if you're in search, you may see um, the own this business regardless if it's verified or not. So you have to be in Google Maps. So that's always the first thing. So if you have concluded that it's unverified and you use suggest an edit, you should be able to see the status of your edit by going into your contributions tab on Google Maps. So you'll see one of two things, either, well, three things, I guess, either it approves, usually it approves instantly within, I want to say a couple minutes, so you don't have to wait long to know. Um, it'll either auto deny, um, which means it'll say not applied, um, again, within a few minutes, or it'll say pending. So if it's not applied, that means that you definitely have to use the redressal form or get in contact with GMB somehow because submitting another edit likely will also get not applied. Like it, it often doesn't matter um, who the user is that's submitting the edit. Like if it's you or somebody else, usually everybody will kind of get the same thing. Um, and that is because there is certain information that Google doesn't allow users to edit. Um, we used to have more transparency into this back in the mapmaker days, but there used to be like locked symbols on certain listings and um, my favorite example of this was the um, Trump Towers <laughs> got locked down um, because when Trump first got elected, people were changing categories on the Trump Towers to like dumpster bin rental and like it was kind of amusing. But um, Google ended up locking the listing. So like every edit that you'd suggest to that listing would just get instantly denied. So there is some level of certain things that Google has kind of canned the ability to, for people to edit. Um, so if you got the not applied, then you'd want to you know, use your addressal form if you're trying to get rid of a listing, um, even if it's unverified. If it's pending, um, those normally take a few months. Um, and that might be longer at the moment because everything's longer at the moment. But generally, like in a non-COVID environment, um, we find that the, those edits that are pending normally get reviewed within two to three months. Okay. That was a long answer. <laughs> it's a great answer and lo loads of detail. Thanks to Jason for jumping in and answering a question from uh, uh, the one of the guys that have posted in the kind of chat box. Uh, really do appreciate people jump in and answer questions if you've if you've kind of made the sort of answer. Um, what? Uh, why do you go to Google Maps to do it? Out of interest, is that the only place where you get the visibility that you need to see whether it's um, verified or not? No, it's just Google shows um, the own this business randomly all the time on claim listings in search. I don't know why they do this. I think it's because they're trying to make it easier for owners to claim their listings if they forgot where it's claimed. Um, but it just makes it challenging for us as SEOs because we're trying to figure out if like the listing is verified or not verified. It's something I think the regular public just doesn't have as a problem. Like it's, it's not a problem to Google because they don't care about SEO. They don't make their products for us. <laughs> Sure. Okay. So you, you kind of use that as your sort of route. Um, and, you know, so within two minutes, you'll know whether it's been accepted, um, whether it's been kind of auto denied. And if it's been auto denied, you just go straight to the redressal form at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, and if it's, be, if it's impending, do you just leave it there and just, you know, wait for it to, uh, uh, to kind of work its way through the kind of backlog that Google has? I don't normally. No, I normally would submit it as well. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to wait three months. I don't know about you, but... <laughs> 
kind of prefer to get results quicker. And usually the redressable form turnaround time is weeks, not months. So yeah, I mean, three months is a long time. And probably now it is. Yeah. But are you seeing, are you, what are you seeing as the, the effect of COVID on, on kind of Google's, you know, pipeline of, uh, of edits and, uh, and work it needs to do? Um, geez, well, I see the redressable form right now, like turnaround times are, are probably a few weeks. Like I was looking at some the other day that were submitted um, a month ago that have been dealt with. So I think it's, the, the turnaround times of the dressable form are still under a month, but it does vary. So it's hard to predict. Sometimes we see wait times up to like five weeks. Um, and sometimes it's like one week. So it really just depends on, I guess, how much is in the pipeline, which we don't know. <laughs> and is that is that what it depends on? I mean, because it sounds like a bit random, like it could be one week up to five weeks. Is that just based on the volume? You know, is it, is it kind of first come, first served? Yeah, like it's, they're handled by humans, right? So, um, mm -hmm. The redressal form is not automated in any way. It goes to a team of people um, who are handling the, the, the request. So um, I think it's just a matter of staffing, you know, and I, I, I'm assuming it, it also depends on how many people are submitting um, stuff. Um, I personally recommend submitting um, less at a time. Uh, the bulk ones tend to take longer. So if you submit like 100 listings in one request, those generally take longer. Um, then if you were to take that same hundred listings and submit them all like individually, um, you'll usually see a faster turnaround time. Okay, that's interesting. And am I right in thinking that the bulk submission is done by a CSV rather than just filling in all the form fields? Yeah, I never use it. I mean, it's faster short term, but I feel like long term it's actually not faster because um, it just takes longer. And then it's harder because usually they miss things. So it's, it's very uncommon for you to submit a hundred and then go back a month later and all hundred are gone like they're supposed to be like usually they're like oh 50 got removed and now you still got another 50 you've got to resubmit so right okay so your your kind of best practice kind of guideline is do it, go, do it one by one take the hit on the extra right. time up front because they can't i guess they could miss some in the csv but if they go to one by one in the actual kind of different yeah. forms they're more likely to kind of get to all of those yeah. yeah. And I mean, I do submit some at a time, like if it's, you know, same business and I've got three listings, let's say I would submit all three in one form. Um, but I don't do anything over 10. Okay, fine. So if, it's, if, you, if you're encountering you've got three duplicate listings or three listings where they're kind of breaking some sort of, you know, name rule spam, um, you might submit those all on the CSV at once. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, out of interest, do you get a sense of how big the team is in Google that deals with uh, the addresses? Yeah. Not big enough. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, they do they do publish stats on um, how many fake listings their system automatically detected. So this is not, um, and they did also publish stats on the um, redressal form as well. I cannot for the life of me remember what they were last year, but I want to say it was like three hundred thousand or something like that that they got all year. Um, it was in my Mozcon presentation last year, and I remember like looking at the numbers, thinking it was actually really low because I was wondering how much. Yeah. Like I was trying to calculate in my head how many my team probably submitted last year. <laughs> I was like, wow, like 300,000 as a total is not really that many. Um, but they also automatically, you know, detect spam. So that number was way higher. That number I think was 4 million um, last year. But Google published it all in a blog. Um, so I can grab those numbers and get them out to you guys later. But I think yeah. that's what those were off the top of my head. Okay, maybe uh, we've got uh, uh, Jamie and Steph from our, our kind of marketing and content team. So maybe uh, they might kind of uh, see if they can identify uh, that post and sort of share it now. Um, yeah. uh, okay, great. Great start, Joy. Let's jump over and go to uh, the next question. Um, I hope, uh, hope that answers your question for you, Darcy. Next question comes from Crystal. Hey there, Crystal. Hey, you're doing well. Um, Crystal has actually managed to spam uh, the spam question here by putting three questions in one. So uh, let me uh, let me kind of unpack these uh, for everyone. Um, how do you identify uh, the solid results that are produced from spam fighting? Um, and I guess that probably leads into the next few questions. Actually, so maybe I was unfair in saying it was spam, Crystal. Apologies for that. Um, you know, do do you have certain reports that, where you can show the impact of spam? You know, on phone calls and rankings. Um, and then you know, ultimately, how does that, how do you lead through to kind of communicating the importance of spam fighting to, to, uh, to clients? So I guess it's about validating the work that you've put on this front and making clients understand the importance of it. Yeah, so I mean, we've had clients where that's literally all we've done. So it's kind of easier to measure the impact if that's all you're working on okay. and you can see the difference in conversions. Um, I, I would say, you know, that's, I'm not recommending that as a strategy. Um, I think most businesses, you know, need all parts of SEO. 
Um, but that being said, we normally, for, for clients where we're doing lots of different things, how we measure it um, usually is by using tools. So for example, Bright Local, um, we would look at sending the clients before and after shots, screenshots. So if we have a, a keyword that we know gets a lot of search volume and sends a lot of conversion, and we're able to move them from position four to position three, we can show them like, here's the before picture using a screenshot from Bright Local, and then here's the after picture. And usually like clients can look at that and say, oh, that makes sense. Like I'm not ranking now I'm ranking. Obviously we would see a spike as well in traffic conversions, et cetera. Um, so as long as you are going after um, keywords that actually have volume, this is where I see a lot of people get it wrong. They go after keywords that get no search volume. Um, you will see, you know, measurable differences. Um, the other tool that we use that um, is good for visuals would be places scout. So we do just the geo grids. So, you know, here's your ranking before, here's your ranking after tends to have like a pretty um, good picture because you're not just seeing like, how do I rank in this specific zip code? You're thinking, holy crap, my rankings across like this giant area all increased as a result of removing a few listings. Um, so no miles, you said that that feature is coming to Bright Local as well, which will be exciting. Um, it is. Thanks for the plug, Joy. We have our own uh, kind of <laughs> geo map grid scan tool uh, coming out this quarter. So uh, very excited <laughs> about that. And hopefully it'll have the same sort of functionality uh, as other tools out there, if not a little bit more. Um, in terms of uh, kind of client awareness, um, do, do most clients get a sense that there's spam out there? Um, you know, does something you have to educate them about? Or is it do you just think it's, this is part of the tactics that we employ for a customer? We're just going to do it because we know it works. Yeah, so I'd say it varies. Some clients are very aware of it and they um, literally come to us and like hire us to help with that. And then some don't know how it impacts them. So it's fine. We just do it anywhere because we see the impact. So we know what's impacting them and we put it on their reports and stuff. So it just varies, I think. And also, you know, if people are um, kind of familiar with Google's rules then they're more likely to understand how it's impacting them. So that's, it just depends on how um, educated the business owner is in the space. Okay, and is spam finding something you do for for every client as as, as no. part of a sort of standard uh, sort of package or? No, there are definitely some clients we we have that don't need it at all. Like we have some in the um, self storage space, for example. We see like next to no spam in that industry, like um, almost none. Um, so they wouldn't need it. Um, I think I think we had a jeweler same deal, but like there are certain industries where like if you aren't removing spam, you're never going to succeed. So like garage door this garage door repair industry would be a great example. Like if you're not regularly looking for um, new listings, you might get some removed, but new ones will pop up in months because of the volume is so high. Same with personal injury lawyers. Um, literally like we're starting to see new listings get created since the freeze is now off um, for new listings after Google shut it down for a couple months due to COVID. So like literally had Jason Brown who's on here um, looking for one of our clients the other day in California and like, oh, look, all these new listings. Um, so it's it's constant in certain industries. And in terms of how when you're doing it for a particular kind of client, do you see it as a, as a tactic that's kind of a little and often? Uh, or do you kind of do it in large attacks? You go, OK, this month we're going really after this and then next couple of months you leave it. Or is it just a kind of thing that you, you have to kind of execute on, you know, month in, month out? So it depends on the industry. I'd say like if it's a high span vertical, monthly for sure. If it's a medium, then we do it usually in spurts because it, the new listings don't get created in volume. Um, it usually depends on if there are companies out there creating lead gen listings in your industry. So those tend to be the real deciding factor, like for locksmiths, garage door, personal injury lawyers, uh, anything emergency repair related. There is so much spam being created on a regular basis by I don't know how big of a group it is, but there's a large group of, I want to say a large group of black hat kind of SEOs or just SEOs that do this as their way to get clients traffic. So maybe they don't consider themselves black hat, but they create lead gen listings in mass, sell them. There's like Facebook groups, you know, dedicated to these types of things. If you are in an industry that has that, um, then you're going to need to do it on a pretty regular basis. Insurance surprisingly is one we see regular, um, for like new fake listings, which you wouldn't think. And do you, and they, when you classify sort of fake listing, do you typically see that as being a lead gen listing where someone is just trying to kind of capture a lead and sell it on to a, a genuine provider? 
Yeah, so like I think Google's done a somewhat decent job of cracking down on like virtual offices and a lot of like the spam that was coming from business owners. So like, you know, trying to have 15 offices when you really have three, like we still see that, but not at the same volume. Lead gen is really where the volume is is there. Mm -hmm. And like an example in the insurance industry I've been watching over the last couple of years, it's gotten worse um, in the sense that like, I almost feel like what the lead gen listings are doing is illegal. I don't know. I'm not a lawyer, but I'm like trying to rack my brain around how they can do it and still stay within the law because the listings that we're seeing are actually named as real insurance companies. So we have seen fake listings for Progressive and Geico and the General and Allstate, um, like all these major insurance companies that have trademarks. We see fake listings that are titled Geico auto insurance or Geico home insurance, and it's not Geico. You call and it's a lead phone tree that goes to a lead company that sells the lead. Um, I don't know how that's legal. Like, I yeah, don't that's know. that's staggering. I guess maybe there's <laughs> uh, there's no there's no kind of easy way for to you know to kind of Google to reproach them or to uh, uh, to kind of track them know. down. Um, okay, let's go on to the next question. Thank you uh, for that great uh, great set of answers there, Joy. Um, okay, next question comes from uh, Amy. Um, it says, what items do you report by suggesting an edit uh, and which should be documented and set by the, the, the redressal form? So we've talked about when you might go to either of those, um, but which items specifically can you report via the edit and which, some, which ones you just have to go straight to the redressal form to, uh, to get them looked at? Yeah, I mean, normally I'm using suggest an edit to fix names or get rid of listings. Like those are really the only two that are really going to be impactful for your client, right? Because Fixing a name, so if you've got like a plumber that's listed as like best plumber ever Seattle as their business name, that is helping them rank. So fixing their name to their proper name um, is going to help your client. So that's one that I'd use it for. And the other would be to get rid of a uh, fake listing. So um, suggesting it, okay. reporting it as doesn't exist or spam or private home, depending on the scenario. Okay, so there's this so anything with uh, wanting to kind of edit and adjust a name, or actually trying to remove an entirely sort of fake listing from there. That's then you go to edit. Mm -hmm. If there's anything else, how about review spam? <laughs> yeah, well, review spam you can't do anything with with suggest and edit. There's no option to really report reviews. Um, I mean, I think they added an option in the Google Maps app, but it doesn't work. Um, so as of right now, the only way to really report reviews is to send it to GMB support team. And previously, um, they've kind of changed this a bit, but current, I'd say currently the only two kind of support channels you can use to report fake reviews would be the Google My Business Forum or social support, which is currently shut down. But I don't know, I don't know if they can still submit a case on social. I want to say no, but um, normally you use do you mean, do you mean in, the, in the current time? Because they say the sort of social channels are not being monitored at the moment. Yeah, they're sending everybody to um, email. I, I don't know if the, the team that gets the emails can even do anything with fake reviews. We definitely haven't seen any fake review requests acted on in the recent months. So I want to say they're going into a black hole, but I'm not sure. Right. OK, uh, so then there's three there's three avenues, isn't there? You've got the suggestion edit, uh, which is good for kind of names, fan and removing fakes. Um, you've got the redressal form. How, how do you kind of determine how you use the redressal form as well as the, the sort of social channels to get hold of GMB. How do you typically kind of balance up when you use those either in combination or separately? Yeah, so um, I only would use uh, social support for reviews. So you shouldn't spend fake listings there or keyword stuff names. Um, you don't want to send those to social support because they will basically just send you back to the redressal dorm. Jason, hi. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah, very good, very good. Uh, Thank you for doing this. Uh, hopefully we'll, we'll kind of get Joy back and then you know, we'll have the two of you. Uh, we'll have the benefit of both your experiences uh, in this particular kind of area. So uh, everyone, uh, this is uh, Jason Brown from Sterling Sky. Many of you remember him from uh, a, a previous kind of local search clinic as, uh, as well as a kind of regular kind of contributor to kind of Inside Local uh, and to the kind of Bright Local blog. Uh, and obviously part of teams, uh, Joy's team at Sterling Sky. So uh, thanks Jason for, uh, for, for stepping into Joy's shoes so quickly. Um, I'm going to throw you in the deep end uh, with a, with another kind of question that we've got here. Um, where's the next one down? Okay, so uh, uh, I was looking at whether we answered Amy's question fully. Uh, we talked about kind of suggesting edit. We talked about the different processes. Um, 
Uh, I get a question actually I had actually, Jason, in terms of when you report stuff to GMB support via social, um, what sort of um, feedback do you get from them in terms of like whether you're whether it's being looked at, whether it's being approved or any action to be taken? Uh, so pre-COVID, uh, we noticed that the turnaround time was within 48 hours. Uh, so they Google did do a, a big uptake in trying to fix social. Uh, it was severely lagging. Um, but due to COVID, it's completely shut down. So what happens is you have to follow uh, their Twitter account so that because they want to send you d uh, DMs. And so they'll DM you with a follow-up question, and then you can communicate to them. So it, it was actually pretty effective um, instead of having to come to the forum and wait for you know a product expert to weigh in and try to escalate something to Google. So it, it definitely uh, was working really, really well and just – uh, you know, COVID's pretty much sunk everything. So I, ex I expect that to work, to work again to the same extent once uh, Google's able to go back to, you know, to normal, but I don't see social support working for the remainder of the year. I really do you think for the remainder of the year, I think it's going to be that, that long until they get it back up and running. So in the meantime, then, if we identify review spam, you know, what's, what's, what tactics are you taking to report that and get it addressed? Uh, actually, there isn't really any channels right now. So, uh, you know, because we're not able to really, we're not able to escalate spam over to Google right now. So it's it's definitely one area we're we're noticing. So we've been, you know, speaking with, you know, the powers of be at Google and like, you know, saying, hey, look, these are the things that we need. You know, we need to be able to, A, report re um, residentials. We need to be able to go after, you know, fake reviews. And so right now it's like, I hate to say this, I, I've said it before, but it's kind of like the wild, wild west when it comes to uh, to, to spam on, on maps. So there's we're severely limited into what we can do. And we're now starting to see, now that reviews are starting to work again, we're now starting to see an uptick of fake reviews, negative reviews, attacks. So, I mean, if you're under a negative review attack, definitely come to the forum. You know, that's like something that definitely needs to be, you know, addressed. But if you're, you know, wanting to report a listing that's, you know, buying fake, that's getting fake reviews. You can't really do anything. So unless you're, you know, can find like, you know, evidence of a contest, then definitely come to the forum and we'll definitely advise you on like the best steps. But yeah, we're, our hands are severely tied because of uh, Google's uh, current state of GMB. Yeah, that's tough. That's very kind of frustrating. Particularly, I guess, as things are starting to move now on the review side, you're starting to see uh, sort of fake reviews, uh, fake reviews come in. Um, okay, great. Uh, thank you for that, Jason. I'm going to pick the next mm -hmm. question uh, off from the list. Um, where are we up to now? Um, okay, uh, another question from uh, Darcy. Um, can you describe what your sort of typical redressal or submission form looks like or should contain? Um, let's say for a single submission or kind of a multiple, like, you know, what do you think are the must have things to be included so that um, the people manually reviewing it at Google know, um, can, can make a quick decision and hopefully a positive decision in your favor? Uh, as, yeah, as much evidence as you can. So, for example, I had one where they were actually at a hotel. And so what I included, so I said, you know, this is a fake listing. This is a hotel address. And I included the link to the hotel. So that way they could, Google could actually easily see, look, this is the address that they're claiming. This is the address that they're at. And so, you know, it, it's, it's basically just trying to like educate Google as to what it is you're seeing. So um, if it's name spam, then you want to say, look, this is their, this is what they're listed as. This is what the name needs to be. And this is the information that you can see, like their website says this, their signage says this, a link to this, to the, to the Google signage. If you can make this as easy as possible for a human to go in there, because they don't want to go in and have to do like all this extensive research. Like you have to think about it as you got to answer the five W's, right? The who, what, when, where, why, and how's, right? So as long as you can tell them everything that you're seeing so they don't have to guess, it'll speed things along. And and so if you want to do, you know, so we have some clients, they actually do documentation. So they'll create a Google Drive with Street View. Uh, they'll look up the businesses with the DOT and with the Secretary of State. So if you could show evidence that they're not registered anywhere online, they don't have any licenses, that'll go a long way with helping to get your uh, your submissions approved. And then what happens sort of in the back end of Google in terms of intelligently understanding uh, and stopping that business coming up again? 
you know, does it have, um, does it kind of create some sort of blacklist that if someone tries to create a similar or identical listing again, it just stops it in its tracks? No, it, it, fortunately it doesn't. We see too many cases where we'll report a fake listing and then somehow they're able to go back to Google and get it reinstated. And then we go and we report it again. And then a couple of weeks later, it comes back. So there, there isn't any like, but like you would think there would have like a case log, right? So so if I had a problem with Bright Local and I logged a, and I logged a complaint, well, there would be that ongoing thread that everybody could go and look at. Just using that example, <laughs> but <laughs> never happens. Never happens. <laughs> never happens no, uh, but you know, so there there's that history, right? Like like you could go, Miles, you could go in and look at the history and be like, okay, well, what was Jason Brown's problem? Oh, well, Jason Brown was doing the wrong thing, right? Like that would be great, but Google doesn't have that, like. They don't have like a way that they can go into each location and pull up a history log and be like, oh, hey, look, we're seeing all this stuff. So, you know, it's, you know, Google doesn't have, you know, uh, capabilities and parameters put in place to just completely lock a GMB from not coming back. Yeah. Oh, hey, look, Joyce back. Joy's back. I've been on the screen, so she'll be uh, she'll be with us uh, with us soon. Uh, please do stay with us as well, Jason. You know, a great to sure. have, you know, get get the benefit of both your experience, which is excellent. Um, how incredibly frustrating uh, for everyone involved in 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 trying to kind of combat spam. The fact that you can go to all that effort. Hey, Joy, you're back with us. Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully, my internet is being really weird right now, so it's it's definitely on my end. <laughs> That's good. Well, well, look look who stepped up. Yeah. We got your man Jason Brown. Who, yeah, uh, I saw. He's, he's, he's <laughs> aiming at the end. So he, he he's been brilliant. And great to have him. Uh, great to have the benefit of the both of you. So if you can both stay on the screen, uh, that will be uh, will be fantastic. Um, Jago, uh, um, Jason was just lamenting the uh, the fact that you know once you've got a, a listing removed, there's very little stopping it kind of coming back. Should you know the kind of business owner persist at some point, there's got to be some logic that Google says no. This has been the the X time it's happened, or is it really down to the person creating those listings just to give up and not 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 kind of, sort of try to flog a dead horse. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, like it's I, I think it's down to the person. We've seen some cases where it's been going on for years. You would think Google would have a way to stop this there's just one company um, from creating new listings and they don't. This, this company just keeps spitting them out. We knock them down, they spin them out and it's been going on for a few years. Yeah, that's yeah. Frustrating. Carrie's Carrie's comment can be more accurate. Logic and Google are not friends. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I guess maybe they don't see it as enough of a problem uh, to put in place the you know uh, the kind of the sort of solutions for it and develop those solutions. Uh, you know, whereas they're developing other stuff for, uh, for SMBs. Uh, okay, great. Let's uh, let's jump into the kind of question uh, box and uh, put the next one down. Uh, da -da -da. Uh, okay, so actually Robert's asked a question about fake reviews, but I think we've dealt that. You have to kind of go and report those on social at the moment. There are no avenues for reporting that. So it's essentially we're sort of slightly got our hands behind our back uh, on sort of fake reviews at this point in time. Um, a question comes from Adam Waters. Uh, Walters, apologies. Do you see um, users that have a higher reviewer level um, getting quicker responses to their feedback? Uh, you know, is there anything that, that might affect the speed which an issue gets addressed based on who's submitted it or reported it. Joy, do you want to go first? Uh, no, I don't think it matters at all who reports it. Okay, I mean, you guys have both, you know, you're both kind of Google kind of product experts. You know, you've got a, you've got a, a line into the kind of GMB team. Does that kind of give you any benefits in this area? <laughs> That's a hard question to answer. Um, I mean, there. Yes and no. I mean, all I can say is the the benefit would be like giving Google feedback on things that they made improvement on, which they do listen to. So it is nice to have an ear on that. And they've made a lot of changes over the years that have been directly in response to feedback that has been given them. So I think that part is super super valuable. Okay, so you you can basically bend their ear to the to the key issues that you're seeing, and then they'll kind of respond to that in terms of their kind of product updates and where they focus some of their resources. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. So exactly. Yeah. Like a lot yeah. of a lot of things 
have happened because of feedback. So they, they do listen. It, you know, they're not as fast as we'd like them to be, but, <laughs> but they do no. listen. Well, yeah, poor development takes time. Uh, I was hoping you were going to say you had some sort of amazing superpowers, but uh, sadly, <laughs> sadly, sadly, you don't. But uh, I think maybe you, I think you're both, you're, you're both covering up, uh, and you actually do, but you're just not letting on to us. Um, no, not really. Uh, yeah. yeah, when you're doing like yeah, when you're doing a suggest and edit, like they don't look at who we are, especially when we're doing their dressels. We're just a regular person doing it. So you know, Amy and I have had like our fair share of rejected edits or stuck in pending forever. So there's they don't sit down and go, oh hey, this is uh, Jason Brown, product expert, or hey, this is Joy Hawkins. We better you know pay attention. You know, they treat us like we're regular Joes. They don't know us from Adam. So, but we do. You know are able to communicate, you know, directly with, you know, people at Google to say, hey, look, this is something that needs to be looked at and addressed, whether they, they take our advice or not, you know, remains to be seen. Um, Jason, we were kind of talking a little bit about how you, you know, you kind of construct that kind of, uh, the kind of right forms, but giving Google as much evidence uh, as you kind of can do, enabling them to kind of shortcut the process for identifying that, you know, something is incorrect. Um, you mentioned about kind of making a kind of Google Drive. Is that something you guys do? If you want, if you need to provide a bulk of evidence, do you is that the you find that's the best way to kind of put it all in one kind of Google Drive and then submit the link for that? Yeah, it definitely it definitely helps. I mean, if you can, yeah. you know, if you can create a film. Oh. Sorry, Jess, what do you? Okay. No, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, it, as much information and homework as you can do to make it as super easy and convenient for them. Remember, this is a real person that's got to go in there. So they want to go and, you know, do quick checks, bag it and tag it and move on. So if they have to sit there and do like extensive research, you know, because they don't see what it is that you're seeing, then, you know, chances are they may miss something or they may, you know, not see all the information. So, yeah, I mean, if you really want that spam to go away, then get them as much information as possible. I mean, there's been times where I've had to go and physically visit a location, uh, snap some photos, take videos, and use that for my redressal uh, to get the spam taken down. So, you know, look, ultimately it's gonna fall on you whether you wanna get that spam removed. It's, you know, Google's not gonna sit there and magically just, you know, take that stuff down, you know. Um, okay, thanks, Jason. Thanks for kind of clarifying yeah, that. Yeah, um, super helpful. When we have clients who live near Jason, just he can go out and take videos. <laughs> uh, your order is a little bit kind of cracky, but I'm going to come to you. This kind of next question, hopefully, uh, it'll it'll hold up. Um, in terms of, um, uh, this is actually kind of is a question from Tom Irving. Um, in terms of tracking the statuses uh, and keeping on top of you know, where things are at with all the things that you report, either through kind of edits or through kind of redressal submissions. How do you guys do that as an agency so that you you know whether things are kind of working or not, you know whether to kind of go back in and, you know, resubmit an edit or resubmit uh, a form? You know, what's your sort of process and what kind of tools, you know, uh, do you use for that? Joy. So, yeah, and let me let me know if my audio is, is not great because my internet connection is still shaky. Yeah. Um, but we use, um, so we have Google sheets for the majority of it, you know, having a really organized process is really key here. So you can ask Jason, we have a very, very specific process that we follow like to the, to the key and, um, make sure everybody follows it. So everybody's on the same page as far as tracking notes and statuses and dates and all that stuff. So having a really solid template um, is really key and having a really solid process. And uh, we pretty much just stick to using Google Sheets and then Asana tasks um, for everything. So those two combined. Uh, do you ever use that as evidence when you're kind of feeding back to customers in terms of you know, stuff that you've done for them or do you rely more on just seeing performance change for them? Um, like you mean, like, do we give them access to all of it or I'm not yeah. sure. Yeah. If you, I, for example, if you wanted to say, look, we've done all this for you, all this work, and let's say it hasn't moved the needle much yet on rankings. Do you ever do that? Or do you just kind of keep that for internal, internal tracking and monitoring? Yeah, well, we, I mean, I guess this comes down to usually what you do with as an agency, um, as an agency, we, we give our clients every month a full list of everything we did. So that's on their monthly report. So they see. I mean, as far as how we did it, like we use this form and that form, we don't get into that detail, but if we are um, sending them a monthly report and we're working on removing spam for them, we'll literally say we reported this listing, this listing, this listing. So we, we list it all out. 
Okay, that's good. That's a nice sort of sort of solid set of instructions or you know, actions that have uh, that have been taken. Um, and what is the policy? You know, once you're kind of re reviewing that, I mean, do you review it on a sort of? Does it does depend on the on the nature of the client? How often you review it? Do you review it monthly if it's a busy spam industry, and you know, less regularly if it's a not so busy spam industry? Exactly. Yeah. So, like our personal injury lawyer is monthly. If it's um, like would say, I want to say we have one in lawn care where it's not as frequent. We don't see as much spam in that industry. So um, every few months, you know, we'll go back, we'll check the status of the ones we reported a few months ago. If there's anything outstanding, then we um, report it again, that type of thing. Questions in terms of, the, I guess, the kind of ROI or the sort of performance sort of benefit, and maybe, you know, one for you, uh, Jason, to pick up. Um, of all the things that you do for customers, all the kind of, you know, the optimization work that you kind of undertake, you know, where would you put, you know, the time spent on on spam fighting versus, versus the, the benefit gained um, versus, other activities that you undertake? Oh, I think it's tremendously huge. I mean, if you can knock out somebody that's ranking in the the one, two or three positions in the map pack and get them knocked out, and then you can go from the seventh position to the number one position just by making those quick changes, I think that's, you know, super helpful. And you can easily show that to, you know, to your to your clients. Especially when you know you're using other you know reporting metrics and you can actually show them, okay, look, this is where you were ranking. You were, you know, had all these seven. So you were like in these oranges and red spots. And now because of our spam fighting, you now see that you're not just ranking in your normal location where you're at, but you're actually able to see how you know you are ranking, you know, blocks away and in other zip codes, you know. So when you can start seeing like those areas just turning green and you can show that to your customers, they sit there and go, Oh, okay. Now I can see it. And, you know, like, you know, some of our clients will actually send them the links to the name and to the CID. So that way they can actually click on it because some of them, that, you know, some people like obsess over, you know, their rankings and their, and their spam in their area. And so when they're able to keep clicking on that and then they're able to click and see that it's, it's gone, you know, that makes it that much better for, uh, for your clients because now they can actually see the benefit of what it is you're doing. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I think I may have even asked you that very same question in our previous webinar. So I think you may have given a very, good, very similar answer. So things haven't changed in four weeks, uh, which is which is uh, which is kind of good to know. Uh, unfortunately, she's have lost Joy. Um, we'll keep uh, inviting her back on uh, as she kind of comes back. But uh, brilliant that we've got uh, we kind of got Jason here. Um, yeah. uh, okay. Um, a couple more questions for you around this, Jason. Ah, she just changed in front of my eyes. Um, do you recommend um, when you report spam? Um, that you report with an email um, that is not linked to your listings. Um, I guess, you know, what are, what are the sort of potential kind of pitfalls or benefits of, you know, the account that you choose to report uh, listings with? Uh, well, if you're using Redressal, whatever you're logged into is the email, that you're, is the account that they're going to send the email back to. So it's not going to matter uh, at that point. Like I said, they're going to check it, you know, either way. The issue you could run into is if, just in edits and it's kind of like that game minesweeper so if you start hitting a bunch of listings that you're just trying to go after and you're trying to knock out legitimate listings and google has an issue with that uh they will end up blacklisting your entire account and so if you are if that's your email account and you have all of your clients associated with it they're going to do what's called an account level suspension so every listing in there is going to get is going to get suspended you know, it's kind of what we saw back in uh, the President's Day Massacre, where a couple, where a, a vendor out there had a bunch of their uh, user accounts uh, get flagged, and they had, you know, a massive amount of suspension. So, uh, I think there's a couple of SEOs that it, this has actually happened to. It, it happened to me once, um, but you know, somebody else actually it happened to them, and they actually shared it. So I was under NDA. So, yeah, it, it can happen. Uh, it's not something you want to you want to you know have to deal with. Because then you have to, you know, create a whole new account, uh, get all those listings transferred over to that to that new account, and then file for reinstatement. And it's just a pain in the butt to do. Uh, we've got a plug for next week's webinar with Ben Fisher. We're talking about a kind of GMB no. suspensions and the kind of tactics you can take or the avenues that are open to you uh, for getting your accounts kind of reactivated or you know, kind of starting uh, all over again. So just to kind of clarify, then that that potential sort of threat of having uh, you know your account kind of blacklisted and getting an account level suspension. Um, do you see that only really happening when, you know, it says you happen to yourself, but do you see it happening when people are sort of trying to take down genuine listings 
uh, and Google sees this as um, you know kind of malicious activity and flags your account for that. Yeah, I, I, exactly. I mean, I was trying, uh, you know, I wasn't like spam fighting, spam fighting, but there was a lot of unclaimed medical listings. Um, and so I was like going through and, you know, I, you know, I didn't see like a sign for like this one business as I was like moving around. And so, you know, that, that edit and another edit, you know, caused some issues. And so I ended up getting my own uh, business account suspended. I, I only had one listing associated with it, so it wasn't too big of, a, of a, an issue and a headache. But yeah, that unfortunately can't happen to people. Interesting. So I guess the kind of word of warning uh, is that, you know, when you do this, make sure you're only kind of submitting, uh, submitting legitimately uh, sort of false army listings with kind of clear evidence of that. Um, don't just sort of scatter, take a scattergun approach and go and pick off with things that you suspect might be. Make sure you've got the evidence to kind of back it up uh, to sort of support your claim. Correct. Yeah. 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 Do your due diligence. I mean, there's been times where like I thought something was, you know, was was fake because I was using, you know, Street View. And uh, apparently the Street View, because of the map pane, was put in an incorrect spot. So it looked legitimately like spam. And then uh, you know, when I was communicating directly with with uh, a Google employee, you know, I, they they showed me exactly where the photo was, and I was like, "Wow, I didn't even see that." And they're like, "Oh yeah, well, you had to, you know, look here and here." I was like, okay, so the, I mean, you know, look, you know, we're all human. We're all, in, you know, we can all make mistakes. So just just want to make sure you're just dot dot always dot your eyes, cross your teeth, because you know, there's quite a few uh, situations that you can do some more you could do more harm to yourself than trying to go after the listings yeah okay pretty quick jason thank you um let's jump into the next question uh thanks for joy for also kind of helping out uh, on answering questions in um uh in the chat as well that's great um right what have we got next uh, uh we've answered that one already which is great um we answered that one which is great um answer that one great um answer that one boom, boom, boom. Uh, answer that one excellent oh, yeah, lovely, which is great uh this is a really interesting question i think i think you pronounce the uh, teja uh, of teja is the name of the person who submitted it um do you know much about kind of gmb spam algorithm um do you get a sense of kind of what kind of contributes to that um uh sort of behind the scenes and also does that do any of the kind of manual submissions that get get made um you know by sort of spam fighters they have any impact on kind of google's automated sort of spam algorithm and how it you know might automatically detect spam based on manual stuff being fed into the system uh yeah we don't really have um insights into you know the spam algorithms uh you know per se you know, I don't, we don't think that there is one when it comes to fake reviews. However, we've started noticing an uptick uh, pre-COVID of, you know, users coming to the forum and saying that Google's gone in and wiped out all the reviews. So it does seem like there, there is something going on there. You know, the, the Wall Street Journal article and the response to it, you know, Google did say, you know, there was quite a few, you know, areas where, you know, they had they took out more spam before users saw it. That wasn't always reported. There are some, you know, categories that, you know, listings are not able to, you know, get published. So there are quite a few, you know, of these pending reviews or immediate suspensions when people are creating listings pre-COVID. So there, there obviously is something Google has. What it is, we don't know. And, and even if we, and what we do know, we can't even say because of our NDA, unfortunately. Uh, okay. Uh, is there any information that you think actually when you're submitting, um, you know, kind of evidence to Google that you shouldn't submit? Is there any stuff that you think actually this can work against my submission? No. I mean, if you have, you know, any form of evidence, it's not like they're going to sit there and say, okay, well, we don't like this evidence, you know, uh, you know, you get, you, I mean, you definitely want to, you know, share it. You know, there was a, there was a case where I was working on one, a few, few months back, I was helping one of the maps bees. <clears throat> and a hotel caught fire. And so the the state, you know, deemed them unfit to to serve customers. And so I included the link to the news article saying that they had a bad fire and how the, the safety department came in and 
permanently close the, the, the building. You know, and so, you know, and so I included that and there was, you know, and it helped the same person again, where it was a doctor and he, you know, had lost his medical license. So he kept running around and reopening his listings, even though he was under a medical suspension. So I used that proof of that medical suspension articles to show that he does not qualify for listings, whether he's got the signage or, you know, and he's registered in the state. He doesn't have a medical license, so Google went in and, and ended up removing those listings because of it. So, yeah, more more evidence is key. That's a really sinister sinister story, there, Jason. <laughs> I've got medical practice running around having been been disbarred, or been suspended. Uh, terrifying. Yeah. Um, this is a good question coming from Jack actually about sort of fighting spam at scale. So his question is: My agency manages over two hundred GMB profiles. You know, do you have any tips of fighting spam at scale? Maybe it's tools, processes. Um, Anything that you would you would apply, you know, when you're dealing with that many locations? No. Uh, basically, what I what I would what I did when I used to work for the multi-location agency, and it still works now uh, today with Sterling Sky, is focus on the areas where you're struggling the most. And so, yeah, you know, and so you know, when I was you know working for this one you know location, this one business with in the health space, I'm in the beauty space. I would look at the locations that were struggling to rank the most and that, those were the areas I went into. And so there was, you know, a lot of spam where people were doing keyword stuffing, they were creating listings at their houses. And so I just basically went in and I was like, okay, well, if we can't rank with all of our normal methods, you know, uh, optimize GMB, optimize website, then, then hit those. And so you don't have to, you know, go in and hit like all 200 locations all at once. But look at your poor performers and start working on and start working on their areas and you know start cleaning start cleaning up those spaces and then you can move on to another one. But I mean, if it's like, but if it's like all 200 locations are all filled with just spam, then in that case you're going to want to you know hire you know some staff you know on a temporary basis to, to come in and do that or you know look into hiring an agency that can you know go in there and, and try to focus on. I mean that, and you know, one of our clients, they're, you know, a nationwide brand. And so they tell us, you know, look, I want you to hit this city, this city, this city, and this city, and this is the order. And then we just go, and then I just go in there and take a two hour chunk and just start, you know, cutting through all the junk in their area. Interesting about sort of scale. I mean, do you, I guess that the act of, of tackling scale is about um, attention to detail, assistance, knowing what you're looking for. Um, these things can probably all be kind of trained fairly easily. I mean, do you think at scale it's worth having, you know, one or two dedicated people in an agency who just focus on this? Um, or do you think it should be part of every good local SEO's job? Yeah, I think you should have somebody specifically dedicated to that if you are in one of those areas, you know. So, for example, the, uh, the personal injury space, you know. Um, you know, that's something you can easily do on, on mass scale if you are, you know, in California or, you know, or in Texas, uh, you know, it, it's, you know, it's so easy. You know, one of the, one of my colleagues, you know, he just sent me a screenshot of the 70 fake listings that he just reported and, you know, <laughs> for his client, you know, and so when you can kind of, you know, start seeing some of those, you know, uh, same signals over and over again, and you start knowing what to look for. I mean, it, it makes it so easy. You know, I can go in, I can go in and report a hundred listings in 20 minutes, you know, all across the United States. If I know what to, if I, once I know what to look for, I find those keys. So, wow. You know, it, yeah, it just a hundred and 120 minutes. No, 20 minutes in under 20 minutes, hundred and twenty minutes. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. And you think that's just because you've basically honed your eye and you understand kind of what you're looking for uh, and you know the telltale signs and you've just kind of, you know, it's become a, a kind of honed practice. Um, that's fascinating. I guess for agencies who are going to kind of undertake this, doing it at scale, um, there's a real value in them, you know, getting training, dedicating, getting a dedicated person uh, sort of focused on it. Um, wow. You're a, you're, a, you're a spam fighting demon, uh, that James. <laughs> yeah, ask yeah. Amy. I helped I helped Amy Toman on on one. You know, and it was you know she was like, look at this guy, look at this guy. And I was like, oh, I know that. <laughs> just went in and you know for fun and you know whacked them out. You know, while yeah. while my whole family was sleeping. <laughs> fighting spam for fun. You should definitely get a t-shirt yep. with that on. That. 
Um, uh, Laura's asked a question. Is anybody report uh, category spam or what's the best way to, to get that addressed? Yeah, there isn't any way to uh, report category uh, spam. So, uh, you know, I mean, there's not going to be like that much in category spam. Uh, you know, you, you, you can do a suggestion edit on whatever category is showing. Um, but, you know, again, it's one of those things where it's like, is it really going to move the needle that much, you know, you know, to go from, a, you know, a personal injury attorney to to a law firm? You know, there, there's also certain suggested edits on the categories that, you know, can backfire on you. And those are definitely the cases where you can get yourself into trouble and cause uh, an account level suspension. Do you want to explain a little bit about how that might become a problem? Is that in terms of what, submitting incorrect edits? Yeah, inc yeah, submit, submitting incorrect edits can can get you into to get you into trouble. So if you're trying to you know level your playing field and you don't want them you don't want them showing up as you know a personal injury attorney and you want them just showing up as a lawyer, well, okay. then Google's gonna you know not like that as much. Okay, interesting. Okay, um, question for Ken. Um, it says this is a fake service error business listings are really tough to remove. Um, I guess for one question, do you see that being harder than others? Um, and what's the, what are the typical tactics that you use if you're tackling the spam and S for an SAB category? Okay, so if it's an SAB, what I look for is I look to see, do they have multiple SABs in their state or area? Because uh, you're only allowed to have that one SAB. And so if it's like one of those situations, let's say pest control, and they've got all their workers creating SABs at their houses, well, they're only allowed to have that one. I also look to see if they actually have, you know, at least one legitimate address showing location, you know, where they actually have their office. And so I'll go ahead and create my redressal form showing, you know, all of those fake lists, all of those SAB listings in that one sheet. And also you can you can bulk upload an Excel file too, which is really great, or a CSV. So that way you don't have to, you know, click each one individually. And so I'll do that a lot of times. You know, I'll have my, my own standalone sheet. And then I will I will put in the notes, I'll say, look, these guys only qualify to have one listing because they have a physical location with signage. These SABs don't qualify in their area, and then you'll be able to get those you know, taken out. But it helps if it's all the, the same company. Um, but if you're running into like little one-offs, uh, SABs, well, then that's where you want to go and check the Secretary, Secretary of State, uh, check the local government, see if they're, you know, if they're actually registered anywhere online, um, you know, do some more due diligence, you know, look up their business name and telephone number, see if there's any other citations, any other resources that you can find them in and, and include all that as, as part of your escalation. Um, you know, but also here's the other thing. I mean, there's been times where, you know, I reported somebody for keyword stuffing I and mean, just this morning I checked their listing and Google had removed it. So, you know, sometimes Google might actually see more going on, you know, with, user activity that we can't see. And those are those videos cases where Google will come in and just wipe out that listing instead of just changing the name. Fine, okay, so you might report them for what might be a kind of sort of a, a more minor indiscretion like you know, keyword stuffing, but actually Google identifies actually kind of greater indiscrepancies in their account and actually removes the listing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, we're gonna leave you there this week, guys. Uh, have a great day, rest you are. Jason. Thank you very much uh, for jumping into John of Joy's shoes, those kind of technical issues, much appreciated. Uh, we'll leave it to you and your family uh, to have a nice breakfast.